Hello, Insatiable listeners, Ali here. I want to let you know about my A Path Forward workshop that I'll be presenting live in the cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Philadelphia, New York, and Denver. Traditional goals like lose 30 pounds or cut out sugar do not work for the seasoned dieter. What those do is it gives you more rules, more restriction, and more rebellion, and that gives all the power to the food. In a Path Forward workshop, you will learn your one true goal that gives you the power and enables you to achieve your health and weight loss goals. I hope you'll join me in these live workshops as I'd love to meet so many of you in person. Visit my website, alishapiro.com, a Path Forward workshop for all the details and to sign up. I can't wait to meet you. 15 years ago, or 16 now, I'm 40, I was diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin's in 2000. And Mm. I ended up doing chemo and radiation and my treatment was finished about a year later in 2001. I was really surprised by how many people didn't know how to deal. I think that was the hardest part of being sick for me was the loneliness and the isolation that I felt when so many people turned away because they didn't know what to say and they felt awkward. You know battling food in your body doesn't work. You want to love and accept yourself. And because you're insatiable, you want results too. And wouldn't you know, you bring the same intensity to your life wanting to maximize your time, potential, and experiences you have here on this beautiful and wondrous planet Earth. Fair warning, it will be a roller coaster, but for those insatiable, that's your prime time to thrive. We're here to say yes to the hunger of wanting it all. I'm your co-host, Ali Shapiro, a health coach who helps people end the losing battle of dieting and find a truce with food. And I'm Juliette Berg, nutritionist, fitness expert, and the co-owner of Unite Fitness Studio Franchise. Welcome to episode 66, How Perfectionism Prevents Deep Connection with Emily McDowell. Emily McDowell, the creator of Empathy Cards and a cancer survivor herself, has been disrupting the stationery industry since 2013 with her greeting cards for the relationships we actually have. She has appeared on Good Morning America, NPR, NBC, CBS News, and has also been featured in the New York Times, USA Today, Women's Health, Business Insider, and the list goes on and on. When a friend loses their job, a coworker has a death in the family or any way a person's life has just fallen apart. You have no clue what to say, let alone do. It's a terrible feeling that we've all experienced, but there are real concrete ways to help, and helping is actually easier than many of us think. Emily McDowell, one of the creators of the viral sensation Empathy Cards, teaches us how getting out of our perfectionist ways can create more meaningful and fulfilling relationships. Welcome, everybody. I am so excited today. We have Emily McDowell. Emily, I know that you are, you know, a, a, a humorist and craftist that we ha- have in your book on, but I think you're all, I kind of think of you as a rebel rouser for the people who have a side eye <laughs> when people want to only give happy, like happy thoughts to people. <laughs> I don't know if that's kind of a weird intro. But, I uh, love that description, actually. <laughs> that's really great. So <laughs> at any time. Oh, good, good. So I have to <laughs> tell everyone how I found you. So I, as most listeners know, I had cancer. And Emily, I actually didn't know we had the same cancer. We both had Hodgkin's disease. And I also have a cousin who, who has cancer. And I was reading this NPR article about your cards. And I like sent them, I sent them to my cousin, Terry. And I was like, oh my God, someone else who has dark humor as a side effect of chemotherapy. And she's like, I've already bought a bunch of these cards. And it was like the funniest thing. I was like, oh my God, how am I the last person to find these? So, <laughs> so one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is, did you always have such a wicked sense of humor or did it increase after going through cancer? <laughs> I have kind of always had a sense of humor. I, I don't think it really changed. I actually think I became more compassionate after I had cancer. And I think that I became less cynical after I had cancer. And so I think my sense of humor changed that way, for sure. It also probably is the difference between living in Boston and spending 10 years in Los Angeles will do that to you. But, you know, I had, there's mental illness in my family and I had, I have depression and I've had it since I was 11. And so 
I've definitely used humor to cope forever and ever and ever. And that's just part of who I am. So that's really interesting to me that you said you became less cynical. And do you mean about people or about life or? I just, yeah, both. About people, about life. It what was the turning point for you that made that happen. Was it some, because of going through something so challenging like cancer? Yeah, I think it was going through something challenging. And, and, and I think what it was, was a lot of it was seeing the kind, seeing being on the receiving end of kindness from people I didn't know, Mm. I think was something that really helped break that down and made me realize that was more, I wanted to be that kind of person. Mm. And I didn't feel like I was particularly that kind of person. So it, I think it opened me up that way. Yeah. Well, that, then I can see the genesis for your book, which I have to tell readers, you have to go and get this. It's called, there is no good card for this. <laughs> what to say and do when life is scary, awful, and unfair to people you love. And it was like such a challenging topic to cover. And yet you did it with such humor, which I, I was like, how did you do that? Like, I, I know I kind of just jumped in, but how did you, was this the book that you wish some was kind of in response to the, the, the receiving end of all that kindness? And you knew that how important it was. Yeah. And it was also, I mean, my co-author is, a, is, is a, you know, as much of a contributor to the book as I am. And she has done a ton of research and, and she's an empathy scholar who focuses on how to show up when you don't know what to say and what to do. And she actually has these boot camps in, in San Francisco that she runs that are called Empathy Boot Camp. And it's sort of a how to be there when you would rather hide behind a tree because you're terrified of what to, of how to mess up. And so she and I got together after empathy cards came out after I did empathy cards. And it was really clear that there needed to be this kind of a guide that like that, that, that there needed to be something beyond the cards. Once you send a card, then how do you continue that conversation? Like, how do you, how, how do you talk about these things? Because that was the biggest piece of feedback that we got was thank you for giving me something to say. And then on the flip side, thank you for, for writing something that makes me feel seen and heard and like that you get it and that helps my friends start having conversations with me about this stuff. The cards were, were done based on my own experience, both as being someone who was sick and someone, a friend to people who were sick and sort of what I saw on both sides of that. And when, um, and when were you diagnosed with cancer? When was this part of your life? Oh, I was diagnosed when I was 24. So okay. 15 years ago or 16, now I'm 40. I was diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin's in 2000 and mm-hmm. I ended up doing chemo and radiation and my treatment was finished about a year later in 2001. Got it. What was that like for you going, when you were going through all of that, you know, were you scared? I know, you know, all of this came out of it, having, you know, your company now, but you know, how did the year process sort of transform throughout the time that you were going through the chemo, like was I'm Um, sure it started off one way and ended another. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I had, I was really, I wasn't scared of dying. I think because I was so young, I wasn't scared of dying in a way that I would be now just because I was still in the phase of life where most people feel like they're immortal. And so I think I just had less, which is good. I was really surprised by how many people didn't know how to deal I think that was the hardest part of being sick for me was the loneliness and the isolation that I felt when so many people turned away because they didn't know what to say and they felt awkward. Yeah. Was, sort of, sorry. Oh, whoops, whoops. I think there's a slight delay. I was just going to say, yeah, I totally empathized when you were talking about in the book because you were saying you were in your twenties and most people don't know people who've been diagnosed with cancer in their 20s. And I was 13. And <laughs> Oh, yeah, book, gosh. Yeah. Your book, though, I was kind of laughing because you were talking about people remember the people who stuck around. And I wanted to ask you, like, the most, like, sincere and honest things, like, people did for you. I remember one of my friends brought over, like, the Pittsburgh Penguins had just won a Stanley Cup. And, like, I'm not a hockey fan, but, like, She's like, I just wanted to give you this shirt. And like, and it was just like really <laughs> sincere and like honest. But like now looking back, I'm like, well, how did she come up with that? You know That's really mean? funny. <laughs> Someone else gave me a nightgown because their mom had been a nurse. And they're like, we know what you're going to go through. And 
And I mean, it, but I remember that stuff, even though it was like the kind of looking back out of, out of place, it was so touching at the time because people do run, not, not because they want to, but because they're dealing with their own feelings about how awkward they feel. And totally. And do. it's nice that you could be on, you could be uh, receptive to those gifts, Sally, because I feel like sometimes people might be, might push that away and be like, just treat me like a normal human being. Why are you giving me these gifts? Why are you treating me like I have special needs? Yeah. I mean, it's, but you, I think, I don't know. And Emily, maybe I'd love to hear your perspective. I know once you get diagnosed, you, there's just like, not like you don't, nothing feels normal anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Your whole life is different. Like you're shuffling your whole life is hospitals, all this stuff. And to Emily's point, like a lot of people do, I mean, a lot of people in my, I was in middle school, they couldn't even, they didn't even know because at the time they won't let you do this now, but I put an ice pack on my head and like this tourniquet so that my cells would freeze. So I wouldn't lose as much hair. So I didn't look like a typical cancer patient does now. They've outlawed that because they said it's dangerous because there are going to be cancer cells in your, in your brain now or something. Cool. Like that. Yeah. But, and I would book my treatments on like Thursday and I would just like, it's going to be graphic, but I just like throw up all weekend and then try to come back to school on Monday to try to like maintain normalcy. So, but Emily, like, did you have any, like, I wanted to ask you, like, what were some of the awkward things or like tender things that you remember people saying to you that really, you know, is, for our listeners who, you know, just to kind of back up, one of the things that I loved about your book is I basically feel like this is a perfectionist guide to being, you know, being there for someone. <laughs> And so I just want people to realize like it doesn't have to be perfect. And that's a huge message of your book, which I just- No, think- I mean, right. It doesn't have to be perfect. And you don't have to be Oprah. Like you don't have to be someone who's like, <laughs> you know, like you don't have to be like a therapist. And and the book really, what what I hope people get from the book is a sense of confidence to be able to show up as themselves and feel good about what they're able to do and say, and know that that is going to be really supportive and be enough. And without having to like go back to school to learn anything, you know what I mean? That, that's what perfectionists do. They're like, let me study this and then, or let me read yeah. as much as I can. So <laughs> what is the thing that holds people back from being genuine in, with someone in their time of need? What, kind, what is it triggering for the, for the individual who's not in it? Fear of failure. Like it all mm. comes down to, I am not going to handle this right. And I know from every experience that I've ever had, starting when I was a tiny child, that failure feels bad and the shame associated with that feels bad and the judgment, the self-judgment of being like not good at X feels bad. And we don't really, we're not really used to like sitting in silence and like having that be okay. And so silence goes along like hand in hand with awkwardness and people are so afraid of awkwardness and because we feel like a compulsion to fill the silence because that's what we sort of are taught that we're supposed to do that like the way to help is by solving the problem and if you feel like I can't solve this person's problem there must be something I can say to solve it there must be something I can say because problem solving in general is super valuable in our culture like if you figure out the solution to a problem, that means you're a effective human being. Like that means that you are successful. And so in this situation, people go around and around in their head thinking there must be something like, what should I say? How can I make this better for them? And then a lot of the time you come to the conclusion, like, I don't know, like I'll think of something. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out when I think of something better because I have nothing right now. And then too much time goes by and then they feel even worse. Like now I feel that much more awkward because I let X number of weeks or months go by and I haven't reached out. And now that conversation is going to be like that much worse. And that is really what, I mean, that's how that happens is when people drift apart, it's all, it's all caught up in our own fears of being inadequate. Yeah. And I love that you said in your book, you're like, look, if you pass kindergarten, you can be empathetic. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> totally. just like, it's applicable to anything, you know, whether it comes to someone's going through a hard time or how you interact with your, your boss at work, how you are with your, with your family. If you have uncomfortability with that, I feel like this is all applicable for it. 
Well, and I think what you guys did so well in the book, Emily, is you talked about, yeah, I think we should, because, you know, we led in with our cancer experiences, but this book is about, you talked about someone has a primary loss. And can you talk a little bit about that? I think that's so important because I know, yeah, so if you could talk about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this book covers basically, I mean, the, the what what our goal was is to for you to feel confident in any kind of difficult situation that someone else is going through, whether it's an illness or a divorce or losing their job or primary loss, which is, which is death of someone really close to them, a spouse or a child or a parent. And that's another situation where people just really freeze up and really don't know what to say. And so the thing that's interesting, you know, that Kelsey's research has really backed up is that like the rules for all of it are the same. That it's all about listening, that, you, that it's the same sort of situation where you can't solve someone's grief. You can't, you can't make a suggestion to them or say some like wise Pinteresty thing to them that's going to make them feel any better. <laughs> so you're kind of off the hook. Like, you know, it means like there is nothing, there's nothing. And so what that person needs is just for you to show up and be willing to bear witness to their pain. You know, I mean, that's what we are kind of what we're all looking for when we are going through something super shitty is people to just sort of sit with us and walk with us and not be afraid to witness suffering. I love that. You, you know, you, and and I kind of laughed when you said, you know, don't tell us everything happens for a reason or this will all work out because that makes someone feel really a lot worse. And I loved in your book, you're like, this is not chicken soup for the soul. This is whiskey for the wounded. <laughs> Especially because those people who are saying that oftentimes don't even believe that themselves. They're just, again, saying it to fill the space. It's just, they don't know, they don't know anything right. else to say. So like, they feel like it's that. what we're supposed to say. Yeah, exactly. But I'm I think- so sorry. I hate that one. I hate it. <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of people though do believe like I, I am someone who is, you know, I'm very spiritually curious. I probably someone who is agnostic if, if you had to categorize me, but I'm very, you know, but I want to believe in that stuff. But like a lot of people who would say like, oh, everything has a reason and God has a plan. It, it really feels like, oh, wait, do you think God just wasn't paying attention when he like he's doling out or he or she is doling out cancer diagnosis? Like it really it, and I know people mean well, but it's like when it, it when it's jarring to your point of view as the person who's in the mess. I don't know. It feels awkward because yeah, you- I mean it's it's so we talk what you know kind of how I look at it is that may be like you know I say I'm sick and I have cancer and someone says well everything happens for a reason that may be a conclusion that I come to in my own time and with my own perspective. And if so, great. But hearing that out of the mouth of someone else, whether they believe it or not, and whether you will ultimately believe it or not, is not helpful because it diminishes the, the reality, the very real scary and painful situation that you're in. And I think that very few people when faced with, you know, a spouse dying or a child or having a terrible disease would feel comforted with when when hearing everything happens for a reason. At least, you know, it's a thing that like you get to decide that in your own perspective, in your own time. Yeah. And, you know, well, yeah, that's, that's ultimately healing when we make meaning ourselves from it, I think, but you're right. Like, and, and I liked how you talked about how a lot of times as I was reading your book, you know, and I'm a coach and I work a lot with the perfectionist mindset because our listeners, my clients, it's not that they want to be Martha Stewart, that kind of perfectionist, but it's the safe, the the needing to be safe. And Mm -hmm. I also think that a lot of people say that stuff because when we're confronted with tragedy and others, it also brings up our own feelings of, of impermanence, even if we can't articulate that. Mm-hmm, for sure. Or uh, you're pulling from your own experience. You know, if a friend is going through, let's say, a breakup or divorce, and you have had a similar experience yourself, and then you've come to the conclusion, well, wow, look how much I've learned from that. Look at where I am now. That definitely happened for a reason. And then you just you know, say that to them, like, oh, it's, you know, this is happening for a reason to you too. doesn't really fix anything for that person. If anything, it makes, I would think that would make that person a little resentful towards you. Yeah. I mean, cause you're not giving them the opportunity to make, to, to go through their own process. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, there's a, it's, it's interesting because that's really where 
empathy comes in, right, is like, you might have had a similar experience. Or, you know, sympathy is what our, our, the definition we use, and there's a few different ones, but the definition we use is, you get, di- you get diagnosed with cancer. I have cancer. I've had, I've had cancer in the past. So I'm like, okay, I'm super sympathetic to you. I know exactly, like, I know how feeling, I know what cancer brought up in me. I know that it brought up feelings of loneliness, isolation, sadness, fear, whatever. And therefore, I'm thinking that it's bringing those things up for you as well. And so I'm going to use my own experience to, to be able to support you during yours. And then empathy is when you haven't had the same experience. Like, you have cancer. I have never had cancer, but I went through a divorce, something really different. But in my divorce, I experienced loneliness. I experienced fear. I experienced some, some emotions that I can draw on in order to put, in order to think about what the kinds of things you might be feeling. And at the same time, understanding that even if you've been through the exact same thing, you don't know exactly how the other person feels. So you just ask them, you know, like there's a super simple solution, which is like, how are you feeling about this? But rather than, rather than sort of hijacking the conversation and making it about you and being like, oh, when I did this, I did X, Y, Z, and it was this and it was that. And, you know, I was feeling blah and you end up in your own thing and you're trying to relate. Like it's, it's out of the desire to try to, to support by relating but what a, a lot of that happens is it, what happens a lot of the time is when you get too much into your own stuff is that the person who's going through the thing feels like that you sort of hijack the conversation. Yeah. That's what I loved about your book is it was really nuanced about those of, you know, you can try to want to be helping, but oftentimes people un, un, unknowingly make it about them. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciated that your book brought in this, this kind of, element to it because it was look it, it was honoring like hey this is a difficult thing this is a a nuanced thing to do and you have to make sure like that it's not about you and i really appreciated that about the book thank you yeah i mean honestly you know it's funny i i came into it with a fair amount of knowledge but i learned so much in working with kelsey and working on the book and a lot of it was about that nuance and and the you know sample conversations and things in the book that that those were all that was all kelsey and i think stuff like that is really helpful when you're looking at breaking down this is how this is a this is one way to do it that's maybe not so supportive and then this is a more supportive way to frame that if you want to talk about your own experience i think i mean that that to me is is really helpful in terms of being instructive and sort of explaining the the difference yeah but i even meant like you've talked about how you know sometimes people just don't care enough right? Yes. Right. <laughs> what right. do you mean? What do you mean by that? Elaborate on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, basically it's, there's a part of the book where we say like, if you sometimes, if it's like someone you don't know that well, it's your neighbor, it's someone that's not super close to you and you feel compelled, like you feel like you should care more, but you don't, that's okay. Like it's okay. And it's okay. And it's even, it's okay. If it's not someone that you're, even if it's someone that is that is in your life and you just feel like you're too you're too overburdened like you can't you i mean we have ways to we try not to say like don't do anything i mean there's there's very easy things that you can do to support people and we get into that a lot with texting and like just super easy things but if you have a if you only have a certain threshold that you're able, if you say you're a super busy mom and you have a job and you have kids and little kids and a life and you can only manage to text and you can't manage to take someone to treatment or, you know, show up at their house for dinner, but that's okay. Like, and I think a lot of the time we think about taking care of someone or or being supportive and having, and thinking about it as being this like sort of taking over your life type of thing. Like, oh, it's going to take so much time or it's going to be- If it's not done right, there's no point in doing it. Right. And if it's, and it's, and I have to be X, Y, Z level of supportive and like maybe for whatever reason, you know, I would like to, but I can't, or maybe I don't care that much. And that's reality. And, and it's not, and, and so this book isn't going to tell you that you're a bad person. If you determine that in a particular relationship, you just don't care that much. And it gives you some ways to, to be supportive or not. I mean, it, it, it just, it, sorry that I'm not articulating that very well, but 
So what are some of what are some of the things that the that the, your readers have been saying? Some of the reviews that they've been giving you guys since the book came out, things that they found have shifted for them. You know, we've been getting. I, I'm so thrilled at the reviews that we've been getting. We've been getting a lot of reviews saying this just feels like a handbook that like I should have had like 20 years ago. Like this just feels like overall a guide to life that like <laughs> should have. And, you know, I started reading and like, I started reading this book and I like couldn't put it down and I read 80 pages and it's like a book about illness and grief. And I like couldn't put it down, you know, and I like stay up late reading it. And people just saying, really feeling like, there's certain things that I feel like I understand now that I didn't understand before. And I feel so much better about being able to go into these situations and like know how to handle it. And that is super rewarding to hear. I am really thrilled that it's been getting that kind of a response. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, I feel like our culture, especially with social media and, and everything is about this shiny polishy view of, of life. Right. And, 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 and perfectionists love to portray that, right? Not totally. Again, not necessarily Martha Stewart wrapped up in a bow, because I used to think that that was perfectionist. And I was like, I don't want to be Martha Stewart. Like, I don't care about house, you know, housework and decorating, but it's this like need to make sure that you look good. And I think what your book did was say like, okay, there's no way to do this quote unquote good or well. <laughs> and, and I loved how you talked about like, look, just saying something is better than nothing. Even if you're stumbling yeah. and, and say, this is hard for me. And I think it gave everyone permission to remember that they're human and we're having these messy human experiences. Right. And like, you know, it's impossible to suck at empathy. Like you, it's not a thing. It's a thing that like, as long as you're trying like we all have the capacity for it, you know, and we all, and, and, and it's mostly about support is really mostly about the, the compulsion that, that people have to try, to try to show up, to try. I mean, when you are trying, you are a lot of the way there, you know? And so, cause kind of the worst, the worst thing you can do is, is do nothing and walk away because you're scared. Yeah. I'm thinking about how this applies in my own personal life, but I think, I think more for me, when you were talking about awkward silence being awkward, that's something that I'm trying to work on with myself in certain mm -hmm. scenarios, particularly with my husband to be's side of the family, who uh -huh. I'm trying to yeah. get to know a little bit better. And I come from a very warm and huggy kind of family, and he comes from more of a conservative family. And so the their conservative nature is so uncomfortable for me. And I have to, I'm trying to learn how to be okay with a little bit more of that awkward silence versus always trying to fill the space and and really not being authentic when I'm doing that because I'm like oh so uh, hey what's going how's this right what's, you know right, right. <laughs> it's like so I know you know your book relates to a lot of bigger stuff too but I I think that there's so much out of it that people can get just like you were saying like a handbook for in your day to day life of how to tackle uncomfortable situations which so much stuff for us is uncomfortable because in society there's this, there's, you know, sort of this right way of being versus a wrong way of being. Sure. We have so many cultural expectations that are on us both like from other people and then that have been, that we've internalized as a result of growing up in this culture mm -hmm. that we judge ourselves when we're not living up to them or when things are not matching what our expectations are. Yeah. Do you, Emily, do you think going through cancer made you feel like diving into these kind of difficult, this realness and this humanness a lot differently than other people. Like I sometimes find a hard time understanding how people get hung up on certain things. I mean, I know cause they haven't gone yeah. through the same thing, but I'm like, I love these messy conversations. Like this is where the intimacy is. This is where the realness is. And like, totally. And no, I, I do. And I think, you know, it's funny cause for me, and I feel really, really grateful for this, but I was in a youth group, but like a, a Unitarian, I mean, really as unreligious as you could get, basically spiritual kind of, essentially be nice to each other. A youth group when I was in, <laughs> in middle school and high school that basically they taught us how to be like decent people who, who were able to have deeper conversations than your typical like junior high and high school thing. Like exploring things. I mean, ex like just exploring deeper topics and getting us and getting us comfortable with talking to each other about deeper things. And that to me, I think shaped me 
that was a, that had a huge, huge, huge effect on me as a young person. And then going through cancer, I think just sort of intensified that, that like once, you know, with those two things as sort of the foundation as a young adult, I felt like there's just a lot that I can't, that I don't personally relate to. Like there's certain things that people get worked up about that I just don't personally relate to. And it's not to say like, oh, I'm above that. It's just, a, I just, I certainly get like stressed out about like dumb things too, but they're just different. Like, and I don't, and I just don't have a lot of enjoyment for or tolerance of like small talk. Like I would really like to sit down and like really get to know someone versus just being, just staying on the level of what we, a lot of us consider like politeness, which is, <laughs> which is sometimes met with excitement and sometimes not. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, I do think that cancer contributed to that for me, for sure. Well, and I, I love that you said like you don't like small talk because in my Truth with Food group this last round, like it, it came out quote unquote, but like we were all saying how we don't like small talk and we want to like have these deeper conversations. And I, I think most people actually do. It's just, yeah, no one knows how to have them. And to Juliet's point, I think this book kind of gives us, like reminds us that everyone's going through this messy experience and like, here are some easy ways to like you know, that you can be kind. Like, I love how you said, again, because perfectionists don't like to try. They don't like to look like they're trying. (laughs) And you said like, and they always like to study or like feel like they have the facts. And you talk about like, kindness is your credential. And I love that because- Exactly, yeah. For people listening, and I know my clients, like they love those deep conversations. They love talking about things beyond the chit chatty surface. And I think this book just gives you like a lot of great, like, yeah, conversations or ways to start that. Even if it's, even if it's someone, because I think sometimes we don't have those conversations is what I'm trying to say, because what if someone discloses something awkward that we mm-hmm. then, then we don't know how to respond or, or what if they get in, or what if they are insulted by something that we ask them or what if, you know, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of fear around what if, what if, and it, what it comes down to is like, what if I look like an idiot? Yeah. Like, is really what it comes down to. Like, what if I do something wrong and that pain that I then will put myself through as a result of, of feeling like I've done something wrong, that shame is so intolerable that I'd rather just not try. You know, I mean, as someone who is sort of a recovering perfectionist myself, you know, there are certain things like I wanted to be a writer for my whole life and I and I went to school, I majored in creative writing and, and art, double majored, and then I was halfway through applying to MFA programs and I just couldn't go through with it because I was afraid I wouldn't get in. And so I and so I was like, you know, I'd rather like it was like it was like what I mean and I made a whole lot of excuses about XYZ, but what it came down to for me really was I was applying to some really rigorous programs and I was really afraid that I wasn't good enough to get in. And I didn't want to know that about myself. You didn't want to receive the rejection. Yeah. And so I went and worked in like advertising for, you know, 12 years and ended up writing commercials and then, and then ended up leaving that business and starting my company and, you know, writing cards. And it's like taking me a really long time to be like, no, I'm a real writer. Like I can, you know, and even with this book, I'm like, well, Kelsey and I wrote it together. Like we're not, you know, and and like I see, I'm making all kinds of, I still make excuses for, for myself. So it's, it's interesting how powerful that fear can be, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's so funny because my, my husband actually, he is a writer and he worked in publishing instead of you wrote, he went into advertising. He worked in publishing <laughs> for yeah. like 10 years and he did finally apply. He actually got into the Iowa writers workshop. The MFA. That was where I was applying to. Yeah. 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 But he said to me, I'm like, you're so great. And he's like, look, he's like, because he used to work at the Paris Review in, in undergrad and he was like, or like at the internship and he's like, people, the, the rate of rejection, like you just think like it's so high. So his expectations were so low. And when he called, the, he got the call and he got in, he actually didn't believe it happened. Oh, <laughs> he was wow. like checking his vote. But he, it's, it's been interesting as our lives are very, uh, we're both on creative paths and he is just like, knows the rejection rate in writing, you know? And like, if something happens, like in my business, I'm like, oh, like I do get sensitive about it. He's like, oh my God, please. You know? (laughs) Right, 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 right. But I'm like, I mean, he's a perfectionist too, but he's just like, the expectations are very different. But yeah, and what I think that's, you know, to kind of go back to my point about 
things still do bother me. And, and I'm not saying like, oh, I'm better than like other people who care about, you know, what kind of car they drive or whatever. But I just find that like these kind of deep conversations are what I really love. And I think the more that you do them, the better you get at them as well. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just, for people listening, I want them to know, just start trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also you have to understand that because it's foreign for other people, if you start trying, you know, don't have any expectations about how someone's supposed to receive it or not supposed to receive it. Yeah. That's because a really you're, good point. You're going to have all different reactions. Some people might want to run away from you and just be like, you know, I got to go. And that sh- don't, don't get shut down by that. It's just that they're, they're yeah. just not comfortable with it. You're changing who you are to that. You know, when you change, when you start changing your way of being to someone else, it can be a little foreign for them too. Sure. And it's, and someone's reaction is generally more about them than it is about you. Totally. Like, so Emily, did you, this is kind of like on a tangent, but did you start your business after going through cancer or was it like you just Oh got- yeah. I, I didn't start my business until four years ago. Oh my God. I, Yeah, I went and so I finished with cancer. I finished my cancer treatment and I was like, okay, I want to put this behind me as quickly as possible. I want to never think about this ever again. (laughs) That's what Um, I did. (laughs) But then it caught up with me. (laughs) And I don't want to like identify as a survivor at all. And I just want to like move on with my life. So because it was so painful, like it was such a hard, painful experience. And I had all these all this baggage emotionally about wanting, about just making sure I didn't hang on to it. And so I really just like packed it up in my brain and I went and I, I needed health insurance. I was a a creative and I was like, you know, how can I be a creative person and get health insurance? That's going to be good insurance. And advertising was the answer. And so I started working in advertising and I started as an art director and, and became a writer. And if you watched Mad Men, it's basically that. And then about when I was about, when I was 34, so this is like, you know, 13 years after me being sick, I've still never really dealt. I mean, I've, I talk about it. I was kind of one of those people who would like, I'd talk about it. If someone wanted to talk about it, I never was like, Oh, I don't want to talk about that. But it was not something that I really identified with. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't part of any kind of survivorship culture. I wasn't, I just didn't, it wasn't really an an active element in my life. And one of my best friends from college got sick, got cancer and died three months later when I was 34. And that experience was kind of like really what kind of woke me up. Like I had such a delayed reaction to my own illness. And I think because I was so young and because I was so determined to just make it go away that I didn't incorporate a lot of its lessons and deal with it and do a lot of this stuff afterwards that I, that I could have or should have done. And so I kind of packed it away for a long time. And then Amy getting sick and me being in the position of being the friend and not the patient was what really helped me realize like, wait a minute, you know, those people's reactions 10 years ago to me being sick weren't about me. They weren't about not me not being lovable enough. They were about their own fear because people were coming to me and saying, oh my God, what do I say to her? Because it was like, well, we're grasping at straws here. Like you have had cancer. So you at least have been in some sort of relatable situation, even though our situations were totally different you know, is it okay if I say this, if I bring up, you know, this, is she going to get upset? Like, can I, you know, can we talk about this? And does she know that she's dying? Like, do we talk about dying? Like, how do you talk about dying? And it was just, and it was stuff that like, a lot of it was stuff that I didn't really know the answer to, but I was, because I'd had my own experience, I was more able to just sit with her and be in it with her. And I, and I had, and that was easier for me. Like the, the compassion and the, and the empathy piece was easier for me because I had been through my own thing. And so I came out of that experience really realizing like, okay, there's a lot here that I want to look at. Like, this is something that we really need help with, like as a culture, like this is something that is not, it wasn't about me. This is just super pervasive. Then I, and then right around that time, she died and I started my company about six months later. I had been wanting to get out of advertising for a while and not really knowing what I was going to do. And so I had been, I'd been freelancing and I'd quit my full-time job and was freelancing. And then I had an Etsy shop on the side and I made my first card, which went super viral. 
And what was your first card? My first card, it was actually, I did it right about, it was about four years ago, right about now. Uh Um, And it was at the time there were not, and there, and the card landscape is really different now, but at the time there, there were no cards for Valentine's day for the the person you're kind of dating, but not really. (laughs) (laughs) And so, but that's like half of relationships, like every Valentine's day, like, and that wasn't me at the time, but it had been me like for many years uh-huh. you're in that, that thing where you're like, okay, I guess I get them like a, a normal card and then give them a speech like, oh, this isn't that big of a deal. <laughs> like, whatever. You have a card or you don't have anything. And then that's like super weird. Uh-huh. You know, and, awkward. and so I was like, you know, I want to make a card that is, that is the speech. Like that's the text of the speech. <laughs> of the card. So you can just hand them that and then be done. <laughs> and so it's really long and it's like, I know we're not like together or anything, but it felt weird to not say anything. So I got you this card. It's not a big deal. It doesn't even have a heart on it. It's basically just a card saying hi. And then in like tiny letters at the bottom, it says, forget it. So, <laughs> and that, and there was nothing like it at the time. And so I put it on my Etsy shop and Etsy put it on their Facebook page and I sold 1700 in a week of that card, like to people all over the world. Wow. And I had to then cut off shipping because when you're launching a Valentine card, you should not do it on like January 27th. (laughs) Big lesson, but yeah, (laughs) you have to take the time for the card to get to the people. Um, (laughs) So I took that as my sort of focus group of like, I really want to make cards for the relationships that we really have. And I think that this is an idea and I think that I can, I can write these and illustrate these differently than is, than what's currently out there. And I think that there's an opportunity to do that. And so I took the money that I made that week and I launched my wholesale collection really soon after that. I did 40 cards and launched them at wholesale. And then it's been just growing ever since. There's one that I I was reading that I thought was really funny and it's, there's nobody else I'd rather lie in bed and look at my phone next to. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes that was that's been a big hit a, val- a big valentine hit for a couple it. years ago yeah how did you how did you gear up production for 1700 orders overnight well it was me and my me and my partner and his my stepson who was like six at the time <laughs> and or seven I guess he was old enough to stuff a card in an envelope and friends came over I mean I'd had I had I think the minimum that I was gonna have that I had printed was was I guess I printed a hundred of them and I thought like, I'm going to sell 15 of these, but the 15 I sell, the people are going to be so psyched because it'll be like perfect for them. And then I was just calling the printer and the printer was fortunately down the street. And I would be and I was like, okay, a hundred more. Okay. Like 200 more, like 300 more. I don't know. I don't know how many you're going to, I just don't know. And, and so fortunately, like it's, it's pretty quick. I mean, it, I worked you know, a hundred hours that week, just printing out Etsy labels and putting a card, but it's a, it's a card that was printed by a printer. So I didn't have to do anything to it. So it was just taking a card and putting it with an envelope and then putting it in a mailer and putting the right address label on it. But since everybody was ordering the same thing, that was pretty easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but when, when you don't you have those systems, different things, that's when it gets hard. <laughs> yeah. But when you don't have those systems set up, it's like, Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, overnight success. Ah, overnight success. I mean, mm-hmm. not that it was overnight because you had been developing your craft and all that stuff. For- oh yeah. No, it's uh, right. But it was, it shifted really quickly from one thing to another thing. And then, and then the first, honestly, two years of my company were, we were a different company every three months. And so trying to make a you know, just in terms of like where we were at and the number of stores and customers and trying to put systems in place and trying to hire for position, trying to make up as we went along, having a company <laughs> was super challenging, but we're pretty much past that point now. And, and it's, and it's working much better than it, than it ever has. So it's great. That's great. I always say that chemo and radiation cured me, but, but starting my own business healed me from cancer because it made Uh, me (laughs) realize all these ways that I had, like you said, like I packed it away like you did for, oh my God, so many years. It it came out in dieting and and other health issues, but I'm being obsessed with my weight when I was really obsessed with my health. (laughs) I conflated the two thanks to patriarchal culture, but, uh, (laughs) but I found that entrepreneurship basically made me realize all these places that I had like it felt very unsafe and vulnerable, probably part of partly from having cancer. I mean, obviously that influenced. Yeah, it, but but no, entre- that's a 
really good point. Like there's nothing like entrepreneurship to like bring out all your own shit. Yeah. It's, I say it's spiritual boot camp. Like you think yeah. you're signing up to start a business. Oh no, you're signing up for spiritual boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about just uh, give the listeners a couple of uh, examples of like really great like ideas that you guys had from the book about little things, like not even little things, but the fact that they express a sentiment that someone cares. And so what were some of your favorite ideas that you agreed? Included in the book of how people can reach out, even if they don't like, because I thought what was interesting as you reframe this for me is you don't always have to say something. Like you can just take an action and do it for someone. Find your strength as a support person. And I thought that was genius and brilliant to, for people listening. You don't have to talk and sit and listen if that's not your thing. Right. And, and you also don't have to be a person you're not. So for example, in the book, this is taken directly from Kelsey's workshop. She developed a thing called the empathy menu Mm. and the empathy menu is really great because it breaks down like 15 kinds of, of people. Like for example, if you like organizing, if you are a gardener, if you are a, if you like emailing and communications, if you are a chef, if you are someone who's just on their phone all day, like there's like a, there's a whole, there's a whole, it breaks down a whole bunch of, things that all of us feel like we're at least one of these things. And then within those things, it's like, it gives some examples of like, so if you're going to, if you're going to do, you know, if you're, if you're on your phone all day anyway, like put a reminder in your phone and just send this person a text every day or every other day or send them something funny and make sure that you make sure they understand that they don't have to reply to you. Like that it's just kind of going one way and like, that's fine. And that's the point of it. And, you know, if you are a person who really likes organizing, you can be, there's, you can create a binder of all of the relevant information that this person needs to have, like doctor stuff, scheduling, emergency numbers, like that kind of stuff. If you are a person, a lot of, a lot of the time when you're, when someone is sick, there's like a, a communications burden on them because you have all these people that you're trying to like give updates to all the time. And now with things like Caring Bridge and email and stuff, like it's easier to do that, but sometimes you don't want to be the person writing the updates yourself. And so like you can volunteer to do that. You can like in a super basic thing, you can share your Netflix password, like, or your Amazon, (laughs) like Amazon Prime, like get them, you know, get them Amazon Prime, like, or share your, share your HBO Go password. I laughed out loud when you had that on the, in the book, like, Hey, offer your HB because well, like, you know, it's <laughs> when my parents used to have HBO. We used their password. I mean, we weren't sick or going through anything, but no, like, like, right. People share that stuff all the time. And it's like, you know, sometimes entertainment, like sometimes you can't read a book, like your brain doesn't work to read a book. And sometimes, you know, sometimes TV is the best kind of distraction. And so, you know, things like stuff like that. But something small like that, someone might not ever think to do. So that's such a great thing to offer up. There's no, so I mean, many great ideas. Be the like the car, be their, be their car manager. Like, you know, if you, if you live in a neighborhood where you have like opposite side parking or like where you have to move your car twice a week for like street sweeping or snow or whatever, like, and you live near that person, volunteer to be their like car manager so that they don't have to worry about it. Give them their, your spare key. And every time there's street cleaning or whatever, like they move your car for you. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's a lot, there's a, there's a huge variation in in who we are as people and what we feel comfortable doing. And one of the things the book really emphasizes is like, if you take on something that you like to do, you're going to be more likely to do it. Like if you're a crafty person, make them a needlepoint thing, like make, you know, make them something. I'd be much more likely to do that if I love doing that anyway, than like trying to bake them a casserole. And it's less about what you do and more about doing it with heart and doing it with good intentions and loving and doing it with joy and not doing it out of, out of obligation. And so the, the easier, it's really easy to do something with joy when it's something that you already love to do. I think this is something that everybody who's listening could think about right now and just think, you know, like you were saying, this is a guidebook of how to be a nice person. But I mean, (laughs) really, we do hold ourselves back from being kind to one another because we don't think that we know the right way. There's no right way. So if you think about what are you, what do you already enjoy doing and what are you most inclined to do that could help another person that 
you know, we'll make them feel good and in turn will make you feel good. And that is what creates joy in someone's life. It's not about what car you drive, how much money you make, you know, what your status is, but it's, you know, connections with human beings, real genuine connection. Yeah. I was thinking, Emily, in, in your book, you know, you guys talk about like sitting in silence with someone, even if it feels awkward, there's a gravity there that feels so good rather than mm-hmm. surface talk. And I think about like, I coach for a living and I'm often sitting with people in difficult feelings that are coming up. And it is like, that's why I'm so close with my clients, <laughs> you know? And like those, those sessions are just so wonderful. Like you feel I can't, there's not even a word for it, but I just, I love that you guys brought that up in the book about. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of research too, that shows that that's what creates the deepest connections between us is being present for each other's really hard times. And that showing up and being willing to go there during hard times is what enables more joy and deeper connections during the other parts of our lives. Yeah, I, I like the example you used. Was it was it Mayor Bloomberg or former Mayor Michael Bloomberg? Yeah, so, Mike, Mike Bloomberg. Mm-hmm. I guess he had gotten fired. I mean, it's so funny to think he got fired at this point, but like he got fired from a job and he remembers like one person reached out, right? Yeah, it, and he he remember. I mean, I, th- I think that the quote is that he remembers he remembers everyone who reached out. Like he remembers all like. He know he basically knew like exactly who reached out and who didn't, you know, and he and he so valued the people who were willing to reach out. Yeah, I thought about that. Like he's so successful and all, you know, and all this stuff, and yet it still touched him so much yeah. of who was willing to reach out when he was going through that really difficult yeah. firing. So, yeah, I Emily, I just think this book is like Juliet said. This is like a handbook of you know. I thought of it as like an intimacy guide. And again, it, we've talked on our podcast before. Intimacy isn't sex. <laughs> it's it's intimacy is really being there with another human being in their humanness and your humanness. And I just feel like, uh, you know, this book is, is that for people. And I think, you know, you, we're talking about identity of loss. I think with the election, a lot of us feel an identity loss of who we are as a country, who, we, who the people we thought we knew. And I think this book, I, I know maybe you wouldn't, wouldn't adapt it to <laughs> politics, but I think you need to come up with a second one about how can we really mend these fences and, and, and be there in the messiness when people are struggling and in pain. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think Kelsey may write that book. I think I probably won't. Right. Write it. I, have other stuff that, I have other stuff that I'm, that I'm probably more psyched about myself personally, but yes, you're right. I mean, it is, definitely a need. And it's definitely, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions from a lot of websites we're writing content for and stuff right now for, for, to talk about the book. And and we've been getting a lot of these questions, like how can this translate into the next trying trying to understand? (laughs) Yeah. Like into, into reaching out and trying to understand and, and respect opposing political opinions. Yeah. So what, what is next for you? I'm so curious. Like this, Um, I mean, after well, work. honestly, I am really excited to just run my company and do and and make my pro- make my work. I've had these huge external projects on top of of making my my own work and and selling my own work for two years. And so now that this book is done, I mean, it was I'm so happy I did it, and I'm I'm so thrilled with it, and I'm so excited. But it was it was a job on top of another job. And so having it be done is great in that I now understand what an undertaking it is to do something like that. And I've promised my family that I won't do another big project like that for at least 18 months. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to making, to just, to having a slightly slower pace to working a little bit less and to really make the systems within our company work better and to take what we're already doing and just do it better. I am, I'm also going to be doing more we're going to be introducing more products online that are, that are online exclusive right now. We have a big wholesale program and we also sell a lot online and, and we're going to be doing some more limited edition and online only stuff. And I'm going to be doing some political fundraising. I have a collection of products that's launching hopefully at the end of next week that are going to be all proceeds to the ACLU and that will be online. And I'm looking forward to doing more of that. But a lot of it is really just, just making my, like working on my own stuff and, and being able to actually focus on that will be really rewarding. 
I love that. I, I love, I never realized how much I valued free speech until now it's under threat. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that you're doing that. That sounds so exciting. Yeah. And I saw you're in Atlanta. You guys have a big pop-up shop there. No, it's, um, it's actually, it's kind of hard to explain in a social media post, but, it, but a lot of our, a lot of the people who follow me are our retailers. And so we, <sighs> we have showrooms all over the country that are only open to buyers that are not open to customers. And, and twice a year, each showroom opens for a week. And it's when, and that's when we launch our biggest new collections. And it's when buyers from all over the country come to shop for their stores. And so they all take place in January, February, and July, August. So this month, my head of sales was traveling to, she was in Atlanta and then Dallas, um, Las Vegas, New York, New England, to our showrooms there to work with our sales reps and write orders to stores on all the, <clears throat> excuse me, on all the new products that we just put out. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Well, keep up the great work. I mean, I, and, and you need some space so you can continue to be funny and regenerate. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Where can people find you? Because um, I, you just are such a bright light. I love your you realism. You can find us online at emilymcdowell.com. And then if you want to find us locally near you, in the footer of our website, there is a retailer's link. And if you click that, there is a huge list. We, we're in about 1,600 stores. And you can see, you can, you can type in, there's a search function. So you can see by city, state, zip code, where the nearest store is that carries our stuff. I mean, the nice thing about buying online is that everything is available in stores. I have, like, we have no way to, t to know what store has what in stock, but... If you, if you want to shop locally to you, that's an awesome option. Um, and all of our stuff is online and, and we do free shipping over 50 bucks and special online sales and stuff all the time. So come on over <laughs> and, on, and I'm on social media. I'm mostly on, I'm mostly Instagram is my, is my main platform and I'm Emily McDowell with an underscore at the end. The non underscore Emily McDowell is like a senior in high school in Tennessee and like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely check out her website, guys, because I've been perusing on here and there's like 50 million cards that I'm going to buy. <laughs> oh, thank you. And definitely get the book because uh, Emily Im Il illustrated it too. So it's such an easy read. There is no good card for this. What to say and do when life is scary, awful, and unfair to the people you love with Kelsey Crow, PhD, and Emily McDowell. Thank you. Oh, the book, oh, sorry, I'm just jumping in just to yell that the book is available everywhere fine books are sold. So we don't have it on our site, but you can buy it like at Amazon and Barnes and Noble and your local bookstore. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for that. Thank you so much for your time and coming on, Emily. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to the Insatiable Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can connect with us on social media. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Juliet Unite and Ali at Ali M Shapiro. M stands for Marie. Please feel free to also email us any questions. We would love to hear from all our listeners. You can reach us at Ali at Ali Shapiro.com and Juliet at UniteFitness.com. We'll see you next time.